And the first invited talk to be delivered today is by Adriana Rini from Messi University, New Zealand. And the topic of the talk is the birth of proof, modality, and deductive reasoning. So I invite Adriana Rini to deliver the talk. Okay, good. Thank you, Rohit. <laughs> All right, um, before I do get started, um, I, I did want to say thank you to Kamal and to um, all of the program committee uh, involved in this. And I, I should say, not only is this my first uh, visit to India, it's also the first time I have ever been invited myself as a plenary speaker at a major international conference. So um, it's something that I'm very grateful for and um, something that, that memory that I will always cherish, and I thank you all very much for that. Um, it was, it's really quite an honor for me. Um, what I want to talk about today is actually just a very small part of a project that I'm working on uh, with some of my colleagues in New Zealand, Max Cresswell, who's going to be speaking uh, tomorrow, and another colleague, Ed Mayer, is a logician in uh, Victoria University, Wellington, in New Zealand. And what we're working on is a project that we called a natural history of necessity. And our idea was to look throughout the history of philosophy from its earliest origins, right up as far as we can get to cutting edge discussions today, and to try to look at how philosophers and logicians' notion of necessity uh, has developed, how it's changed, uh, you know, what, what, what can we see about its history and trace about, about the story uh, of necessity itself. Because it is something that you actually do find way, way back even in the very early, um, even pre-Socratic philosophy, you do find discussion of necessity. Uh, but my focus today is actually on Aristotle and a very specific little question about Aristotle. Uh, I'm going to be looking at parts of Aristotle's text known as the Prior Analytics. Uh, this, is the, this is the work in which Aristotle is known or said to have invented logic for us. It was his simple system of what's called syllogistic logic. And um, I've given you a handout because I thought that was probably the easiest way to do this. Uh, my field is very jargon laden and um, I also need a lot of passages of text and quotations which I've given, you, given to you here. So most of what I want to do is just talk us through this handout. But, let me explain my, my problem. Uh, if you look on the handout, uh, just below my first little passage, number one, you see uh, something I've labeled Barbara. And it just says, all Bs are A, all Cs are B, therefore all Cs are A. Now, when you open the prior analytics, this is the kind of thing that you find in Greek. Um, and you find Aristotle saying, this is what I mean by a syllogism. This is his most basic and simplest example of what he has in mind when he is inventing logic. And what interested me in this pro project about the history of necessity is Aristotle's own stated definition of what he thinks a syllogism is. And this is what I've given you uh, at the very top of the handout with a little one next to it. So this is a um, Robin Smith's translation of, of, of Aristotle that I've used here. And uh, Smith translates the Greek syllogismos as a deduction. So Aristotle tells us a deduction or a syllogism is a discourse in which certain things having been supposed, something different from the things supposed, results of necessity because these things are so. You find it very early on, Prior Analytics, Book A, Chapter 1, um, in, in, in this text. Um, what I want to look at, and, and what my project is in this part of our, our, our larger um, study, is to look at this passage where Aristotle says that something results of necessity. Uh, that, that when we do go, when I'm teaching my intro logic and I've got my all oh, A's are B and I've got all oh, um, C's are, oh, let's not do it that way, let's not do it that way. Um, I'll stick to this and save time. I'll get slow if I go to the board. When, when you look at the handout and you see my line that I've drawn between my, my premises and my conclusion and where, sometimes we'll put the three dots to say therefore. 
you know, we do that when we're representing this stuff. Aristotle didn't have our symbolic tools. He, in fact, the whole text is almost completely devoid of symbolic tools, except for the variable, which he does use, and, and you'll see in some of the passages here. But my question is really, if one way to put it is, when you look at that Barbara on the handout, and you see my representation of it with the line separating premises and conclusion, or maybe you put your three dots in for your therefore, I want to know, as close as we can get from the text by studying Aristotle, what did he understand? What actually was his own understanding of the necessity that he describes when he tells us that something results of necessity because of these, these initial suppositions, the premises? So many people in ancient logic and in, in ancient philosophy uh, will simply look at a passage like number one and say, look, necessity is there. Um, very definitely, Aristotle has in mind a modal notion. We use necessity when we mean a modal notion. Um, and certainly, because it's there, it does look on the face of it as though he probably does have a modal notion in mind. But when you start to look at the syllogistic, it, there, there's a real question about how we're supposed to understand, or what we can say Aristotle himself understood by um, this, this link between premises and conclusion. What did he understand by what looks like the logical consequence that he himself is, is explaining. So um, the way I've put it here on the handout, just to give us a bit of a guide, I'm trying to avoid some of the jargon of, of the modern trade. Um, my question is simply this. When Aristotle says that there is a, a syllogism, and when he says there's a syllogism, he always means there's a valid syllogism. He doesn't use the word to refer to an invalid scheme. But um, when he says there is a valid syllogism, does he mean number two? that from true premises you cannot have a false conclusion, where, as I've said here, that cannot is genuinely modal. Or does he mean something that's not quite as, as uh, forceful uh, or sophisticated? Does he mean something like three, that no matter how you choose your subject and your predicate terms, your A's and your B's and your C's up there in Barbara, that no matter how you choose those terms, you'll never, in fact, have true premises and a false conclusion. So um, part of the reason for my excitement of being able to give a talk like this to an audience like you is um, this is a little bit more subtle than I can often, uh, a, a more subtle distinction than I can often make when I'm talking to uh, Greek specialists who want to talk about the minutiae of the Greek. This is a logician's problem. And um, that's what I've set myself to try to say, how close can I get to an answer um, to, to this kind of a thing. Now, um, this is not entirely uncontroversial, even the way I've set it up, um, because you might simply want to say that my number three uh, is, is really all that there is uh, to, to logical necessity, uh, thinking like somebody like, like Carnap would be thinking and, and the kinds of things that Max would be talking about a bit tomorrow, I think. Um, but I want to use modal in what I think of, at least, as the more robust sense uh, that's captured by number two. All right, where it really is a, a, um, a matter of what cannot be otherwise in, in a, uh, a more forceful sense. Um, so one way of putting my, my question is, can we say with any certainty that Aristotle has anything more than a notion that, uh, of, of substitutional validity, that no matter what terms I put in place of A and B and C and Barbara, I'm guaranteed a, a, a um, well, I, I will have, in fact, a, a valid syllogism, or does he have um, something, something a little bit more sophisticated in mind, more like what I'm trying to capture with my, my two? Um, so ultimately, does he understand the relation between premises and conclusion? It, for Aristotle, can we say that for him it's actually a modal notion? Can we get to there? Now, I'm not the first person to actually ask and pose that question. I did find one other scholar who asked it. It was Richard Sarabji um, back um, in, in some early papers, and he does ask precisely this, whether or not we, we should say this is a modal notion that Aristotle has. Sarabji was inclined to say no. Um, he didn't base it on any hard evidence. It was more just a sense of the feeling of what, of what he thought Aristotle was doing. Um, and. Part of, part of what complicates this, just in terms of some initial setting up um, and explaining why this is a project that people have not really looked at, um, or not looked at in much detail, uh, 
one of the difficulties about Aristotle is that you find necessity all over the place. Um, you know, this is Aristotle who, who talks about uh, his theory of metaphysics as an essentialist metaphysics, that um, you know, to be human is, to, to be a man is to be essentially you know, mortal, or, or all of these kinds of things, so that the necessity is just all over the place in his work. Um, and part of Sarabji's own answer, which I won't talk about a whole lot because it is really ancient scholarship there, um, is that Sarabji looks and he says, look, it's so much all over the place in Aristotle that there's no real obvious unified analysis that we can give for necessity in Aristotle. We just have to throw up our hands and say he really has an ad hoc notion of necessity. It's all over the place and, and we can't really link them all up. Some people have tried to do this and, and tried to find links, but, but I think Sarabji's claim is the one that, that stands out, that it's just ad hoc and it's too messy. Um, and one thing that he does then is say, well, let's just list all of the different cases, something that Aristotle himself often does right through his texts. He does give us lists and lists. He, he tells his students quite frequently, make a list of all these things. You want to know how to start your science? Start making lists. And, and he does very much the same thing in a couple of places about necessity too. So um, it is all over, but the question is, can, you know, can one, is there a unified sense? And two, um, when you look at something like what's going on in number one, what does he have in mind? What can we actually say about it? Um, and people simply, I think when they, when they do just give it up and say, oh, it's just ad hoc, um, I, I think that that does tend to be a little bit swift, but there are differences, and there, we, we can't avoid that. I'll talk a little bit about, at the end, some of the, the what I think may be really substantial differences between Aristotle's approach and ours. Um, and the question about whether he has a unified analysis is something that I would also like to talk about as we get further on. Um, yes, certainly. How did, okay, what, what, what the point is this, is that he, he only uses the word syllogism to refer to a valid schema. Um, okay, he doesn't, he doesn't actually have uh, language to, to talk schemas and, and, and make the distinction. When he says a syllogism, he just means a, a valid schema. Okay, and, and I think you just have to take him that way. It's pretty, it's pretty clear in the text that, that, that he he's understands that, yeah. Um, all right, so what I want to do is look at this closely and try to explain what I think are some stages in Aristotle's development that make it pretty clear how we really do need to answer this question about does Aristotle have a, a um, notion of, of logical consequence that we would call genuinely modal. Um, and what I've called on this handout stage, Aristotle stage one, um, I'm looking here at some of the very early work in the prior analytics in the first several chapters, um, which are usually called the, here's some of the jargon, it's usually called the assertoric syllogistic. It's reasoning that does not itself involve modal premises. And um, I just want to go through the text and I want to try, to try to explain to you what I think may be going on and how we can get to, get to an answer. Uh, part of what I do when I'm looking at this question, to say, well, all right, if I want to know this, one place to look um, is at Aristotle's own counterexamples. When he says that, you know, when he says, I don't have a, a syllogism, I've got a, a, I mean, if he could use our words, I have a schema, but it's not a schema that, that is, is one that produces a, a deduction. All right, so when he's got something he wants to invalidate. Um, and I like to look at his counterexamples. A lot of authors don't. Um, and they're often, Aristotle is actually criticized a lot uh, for introducing his counterexamples for all sorts of reasons. And probably one of the most serious <coughs> criticisms from the point of view of this paper is that uh, people have said that looking at the counterexamples right through uh, Aristotle's logic suggests to them that he may not have had a more full blown developed notion of, of a coherent notion of logic, that too much of it was simply by trial and error, that they have visions of the guy sitting at his desk at night, you know, working out, you know, if I have these subject and this predicate terms and so on, am I going to get this conclusion that I, it comes out true or not? They seem to have that kind of a picture in mind of him. I don't think that that's entirely fair. Um, his, his use of counterexamples is 
in, introduced in order to try to show us where he wants to make it very clear that no, his system doesn't, doesn't allow this. And I think he does have a stronger notion of system. Um, but they are very, very helpful for evidence of how Aristotle himself is proceeding. So take a look at what you've got, uh, the first quote from Prior Analytics A4. Uh, under Aristotle stage one. So he's describing when we don't have a, a syllogism. And he says, however, if the first extreme, if your A term follows all of the middle, the B term, and the middle belongs to none of the last, to the C term, there will not be a deduction of the extremes. You won't get a conclusion linking a C subject to an A predicate. Okay, that's, that's what he has in mind here. For nothing necessary results in virtue of these things being so. For it is possible for the first extreme to belong to all as well as to none of the last. Consequently, neither a particular nor a universal conclusion becomes necessary. And since nothing is necessary because of these, there will not be a deduction. Terms for belonging to every are animal, man, horse, and terms for belonging to none are animal, man, stone. Uh, now, I've just picked this passage. It's the first counterexample you find in the prior analytics. I have simply picked this one to use as a, as, as a way of explaining how, how he is proceeding here. Um, and all he wants to do is show us that he's got a structure, which I've given at the, I've given a kind of sloppy way down at the bottom of that um, left-hand page with my one, two, and three. Our premises are all B's or A, and then two, no C is B. And Aristotle's question is, can I get a unique conclusion that links a C subject to an A predicate. And this is where he introduces terms um, to say, uh, it, it, to, to try to give us an example of, of no, why he can't. Now, one thing that modern logicians um, might get frustrated with right away is, is this, and it's an important point in Aristotle. Um, he is actually looking for a unique form for, uh, of, of that proposition which stands in as the conclusion. All right, he's looking for something specifically with a C subject and an A predicate. And he tells us, let's put these terms in and look at what we get. Well, when you put his first set of terms in on the handout, right, you get all men are animals, no horse is a man. And just putting your, your terms in here, you get something like, you know, all horses are animals. Well, it's true in Aristotle's metaphysics that all men are animals. It's true, according to Aristotle, certainly, that no horse is a man. But all horses are animals is something that he's certainly not going to accept. And the other counterexample works the same way, except that it gives us a, 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 a primitive is that I'm sorry, what did I, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't say that right. Yep, yep, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 thank you, thank you. Right, 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 right. Um, I, didn't, I didn't explain that right, and I'm sorry. Max is, Max is absolutely right, and the point is obvious, right? All horses are animals is true for Aristotle, and then the problem is when you come over to this other counterexample that, you, that he gives us, and he says, put all men are animals as your first premise, no stones are men as your second premise. And again, in this case, you get a true conclusion, no stones are animals. So he doesn't find here that single unique form of a proposition that can stand in as a conclusion. So he thinks that he doesn't have a syllogism here. And this is the standard procedure for him going through the, uh, the ones he wants to invalidate and telling us why they don't work. This is just the, the standard scheme of, of, of his method. Um, and one thing I should point out is I, I have actually gone through all of the counterexamples in this part of the prior analytics, and they're all like this. I could have picked any number of them. It wouldn't have really mattered. Um, and the, the point really is this kind of evidence, if this is what you find all through the non-modal, the early part of the logic, uh, you're not going to find in this any kind of answer that's really going to help decide my question of does he have a notion of consequence that is um, taking the necessity there is genuinely modal or is it just what those critics were describing of, of, of a little bit more trial and error uh, and, and not really the sophisticated notion. Um, now, most, and I think part of the reason there is a project in this um, is that most scholars, even scholars working on Aristotle's logic specifically, stop at this point. Um, and this is very unfortunate because the prior analytics, uh, it's not a big book, but 
it breaks down into different sections. Uh, there is what is known as the non-modal or acetoric. And that is uh, books four to seven. And people stop there. Um, they stop there because what Aristotle goes on to do is look at what happens when he puts modal premises into the syllogistic patterns and sees what happens then. And the modal breaks into two different parts. One part um, is, is known as the apodictic. It's about necessity, where you have necessary premises. And the other part is known as the problematic syllogistic. And that's where he's looking at structures of reasoning, syllogisms, involving premises about what is possible or contingent. And it surprised me when I first noticed this. Um, Aristotle spends, it, it, took me, it took me years to notice this actually, Aristotle has four books on the non-modal logic. But this stuff, the modal, is books three and books eight to 22, um, or 23, there's 16 books. Uh, he is clearly more interested in patterns of reasoning involving premises that themselves involve modality. And people haven't really taken much note of, of that fact and paid much attention to it. Uh, and I think in, in, in skipping that, they miss, they miss some important, important things. So um, I want to switch now to the top of that first page of the handout, um, Aristotle stage two and explain a little bit about what's involved in this. Um, when we make the shift from something like Barbara, which is just a non-modal astrotaric syllogism, you find that in very, very early on, in, in, um, that's even in book one, just setting up. But when we start to move to the modal syllogistic, um, I said earlier, there's necessity all over the place in Aristotle, and it starts to complicate things enormously, which is probably why people don't like working on this so much. For one thing, you find essentialism very much at work in Aristotle's logic when you move to, when you move to this part. Um, the essentialism is very much involved here. And as an example, I've given you something which I've simply labeled star on the handout. This is an example that you find right through the, the syllogistic of uh, a true modal proposition, one about necessity. And he says simply, all men are animals of necessity. Sometimes he says, of necessity, all men are animals, or all animals are by, necess by necessity. Um, all men are by necessity animals. It, the Greek lets you put the necessity almost anywhere you want to in the sentence, but, but it's quite clear um, he has this essentialism in mind. And a question then arises about whether or not the essentialism in, oh, I shouldn't have called it four, um, the essentialism in a proposition like my little star is the same as the necessity that's described in um, the definition of a syllogism. And that's something that has complicated a lot of the um, ancient literature. I think it's something Aristotle himself tries to, tries to avoid a little bit. But, but what I'm explaining as you go down uh, this handout is when you move to propositions like my star, all men are animals of necessity, um, the question then becomes, how do we interpret this? What are we supposed to understand? And if you just, just represented it, um, Aristotle's Greek as simply as you can in English, it looks like something like five. Um, this would be pretty close translation. All Bs are by necessity A, all Cs are by necessity B, all Cs are by necessity A. Um, which in the trade we will call Barbara LLL for telling us that each premise and conclusion has a necessity in it. Um, now, logicians have looked at this and said, okay, um, this is not so much now a matter just of, of textual interpretation. We need, some, you know, we need some, some logic at work to understand what's going on in Aristotle. And um, what various people have suggested is uh, that in order to, to make this jump between the non-modal books four to seven and the modal um, syllogisms about necessity, that you have to have some sorts of principles like the K principle at work, where the um, 
the necessity involved in Barbara, all bees, I should put that up, shouldn't I? So I can refer to it. Um, that if, if that's what we start off with, and my question is, what's, what's, what's going on here, right? What's the nature of this, this deduction? Um, one thing that people have tried to say is, OK, we can make the move from that to what I've given you as Barbara, f the number five over here on the handout. Um, but what you need to understand is that uh, the, the, the necessity involved there is going to give us a necessity over the antecedent here. And you have something like the K principle. Um, if P entails Q, right, if, if, if you've got you know, P or Q and we've got this necessity, then um, we can have, I should have put them all up on the board then, shouldn't I? Then we can get to something like five. People try things like this. Um, the problem is there's not a lot of textual evidence that Aristotle has anything like that in mind. Um, other ways that people have proceeded, uh, if you look down at number six and number six prime, here are other ways people have tried to say, how do we interpret Aristotle? What is he doing here? Um, and if you go to something like six and just give it a de re representation where the necessity simply attaches to the term, which it looks like it should if he's thinking about things like all men are animals of necessity, um, then it looks like you may only need something as simple as the T principle um, to try to validate that. Or you can even go simpler still and go over to something like my six prime where I've simply put a necessity on every one of the terms. Now, the trick in this, and the reason I'm just mentioning it, is the text doesn't decide any of this. Um, you can't really find evidence in there to, to figure out which of these, which of these ways um, is the best to try to explain what Aristotle is doing. I've also added plenitude in here. This is something that Jaco Hintica and Mario Minucci have both suggested, that Aristotle has in mind the idea that anything which is always true is necessarily true, and it's... it's um, and it's dual as well. And they think that that's an implicit part of Aristotle's thinking. Um, that is a genuinely modal notion. If we found that in Aristotle at work in the logic, bingo, you know, we have, we have Aristotle doing some serious modal reasoning now. Um, the problem is that we, there, there's a big controversy about whether that's right. And in terms of the logic, um, plenitude is actually very hard to motivate because it absolutely makes a mess of a lot of syllogisms Aristotle says are valid, um, turn out not to be, and vice versa. And it just it seems to just destroy the whole the whole project. Um, Hintica says so what for the you know that's just you know we don't so what for the modal syllogistic it's bad stuff, um, ignore it. But in fact, it does look as though there's more of a system at work in it. Um, than just that. So plenitude looks like a non-starter. Um, all right, so what do we find when we move into uh, the, sorry, the apodictic syllogistic, where we're looking at syllogisms about necessity? And um, let's just go back to the text for this. So halfway down that right-hand side, uh, I've just picked up in the middle of a passage. And moreover, it would be possible to prove by setting out terms that the conclusion is not necessary without qualification, but only necessary when these things are so. For instance, he says, let A be animal, B be man, C be white, and let the premises have been taken in the same way, for it is possible for animal to belong to nothing white. Then man will not belong to anything white either, but not of necessity, for it is possible for man to become white, although not so long as animal belongs to nothing white. Consequently, the conclusion will be necessary when these things are so, but not necessary without qualification. Um, the syllogism that he's studying here is usually taken to be one called chemistries LXX. These are just medieval names for the syllogisms that the students came up with to help them remember. So the structure is just, as you have it on the handout, all Bs are by necessity A. So there's your modal premise. All Cs are not A. And then we're looking at a conclusion, all C's are not B. Um, and when you put the terms in place, you get my one, two, and three on the right-hand side. All men are necessary animals. That's fine, right? All white things are not animals. Um, just simple non-modal premise there. And then all white things are not men. Now, what Aristotle is, is doing here um, is actually trying to explain to us that we get the conclusion I've given you here on the handout, that we do get a conclusion of all C's are not B, 
or a conclusion, all white things are not men. And his point is, hey, folks, when you're reading me, don't get confused about the kind of necessity that's involved in uh, premise one, where you have a premise about essentialism, right, that all men are necessarily, or all men are essentially animals. Don't confuse that necessity with the necessity that ties the premises to the conclusion. So don't make the mistake of supposing that you have a conclusion of the form all C's are not the by necessity, okay, or that all white things are not necessarily men. And he says this, and, and it's pretty clear in the Greek as well, he's, he's got a distinction he describes as necessary without qualification. That's the essentialism. That's the, the necessity that, that um, makes all men necessary animals, right? That's absolute, without qualification. But things that are only necessary when these other things are, are, are supposed, right, or when these other things are so, is the necessity that I'm talking about um, in the definition of a syllogism itself. So he's quite careful to point out the difference and say, don't, don't get confused about this. We've got a conclusion here. That's not a problem. But it's not a conclusion which itself is a modal proposition, right? It doesn't involve any essentialism. It doesn't involve necessity. But it comes about by necessity when these, other, when these premises are supposed. So the trick here, and what's important about it for my purposes, is that as he's given us this counterexample, or as he's given us this explanation, um, premise two is false. All white things are not animals. Aristotle knows that. But it could have been true, since it could have been the case that no animals are white. And Aristotle reasons, then, that we can suppose that the premises are true. And when we do so, we can, in fact, syllogize from them. But when we do, we do not reach a modal conclusion. We only get the conclusion given in, in um, the schema there, uh, or given in three. We don't reach that, that modal, modal conclusion. So what we have is Aristotle reasoning. Uh, syllogizing, but telling us to suppose that the facts are different from what they may in fact be, uh, which is a first move to suggest that he really, it, when we're reading him, we really are having to move beyond just syllogisms involving simple fact, that he is starting to say, right, this, this is not in fact true, but suppose that it is in reason anyway. So this is an added sophistication that you don't find anywhere in the non-modal syllogistic. You have, to get, you have to get to this stage to even begin to see anything like this coming along. And then he does it routinely, OK? Um, So let's switch over then um, to the back side of the handout, where we get more sophisticated still. And what I've called stage three is about deductions involving premises concerning not, not the essentialism and, possible, and, and, and necessity, but specifically um, the problematic syllogisms involving either possibility or contingency. And I should say, um, Aristotle is very, very clear, makes a very s explicit distinction about the difference between possibility in the sense of not, uh, not l not, and a sense of contingency uh, about what's neither necessary nor impossible. Um, so he actually does have both of these in there. Um, and what I've picked out here to highlight uh, is uh, trying to show you some evidence of how Aristotle is trying to explain that we can syllogize, right? we can form deductions, even when one of our premises is simply about possibility. All right, um, that's that's the project here, and um, that actually created quite a stir in um, Aristotle's own day. His student Theophrastus and many others just said, "You've got to be kidding! Uh, a premise about a premise about possibility just is is, is a non-starter. You can't syllogize from there." And and they tried to invent their own alternative logics in order to show why Aristotle messed up and should have done what they think. Um, but Aristotle is actually quite clear about this. He thinks we can reason about possibility, and he wants to show us how. Um, 
so we start off with some premises that are in, that just say something is possible and what he does and I'll, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a preliminary about this and talk you through the text um, and you can see whether or not whether or not you think my my analysis is actually borne out by the text what he does is says suppose that we do have a premise that is just about that is just involving possibility um, when you've got a premise like that one thing that you d can do because if, if you if you just have the possibility there it's going to block your, your, your syllogizing kind of kind of obviously unless you in introduce all sorts of fancy tools and what he does is this he says if you've got a premise that says something is possible then suppose that that possibility is actual suppose that the possibility is in fact realized and then continue on your merry way reasoning just the way we've been doing you know all through all the rest of the syllogistic up to you know getting up farther along into these later books at this point um, things that his students will know and be comfortable with by this stage so when you meet a possibility and you want to you want to give a proof and you want to f complete your syllogism and deduction look at that possibility suppose that it is actualized suppose that it is realized and then continue your reasoning on the basis of that uh, of that realization so you're reasoning then non-modally no modal involved anymore um, so we're looking at something um, which we suppose is actual but then the, because it's possible right it might be true but it might be false and he's very much aware of this uh, and he understands that if something is possible it might be true and that if it is possible then supposing that it really is true um, might in fact lead him to a falsehood but he says look yeah it might lead me to a falsehood but it's never going to lead me to an absurdity um, and I want to talk you through this because I think this is, is getting as close as we can to knock down uh, evidence that Aristotle really does have um, a notion of what I'm calling that, that more robust sense of necessity involved in, in syllogisms. So look at, look at what he says. Um, and this is from quite late in the analytics, um, chapter 15. Now with these determinations made, let A belong to every B. I've put the numbers in to tally with the, the sketched out proof below. Okay, with these determinations made, let A belong to every B and let it be possible for B to belong to every C, then it is necessary for it to be possible for A to belong to every C. But let it not be possible and put B as belonging to every C. This is false but not impossible. Therefore, if it is not possible for A to belong to every C and B belongs to every C, then it will not be possible for A to belong to every B for a deduction comes about through the third figure, he tells us, but it was assumed that it is possible for A to belong to every B, therefore it is necessary for it to be possible for A to belong to every C, for when something false but not impossible was supposed, the result was impossible. All right. Um, I've tried to make this easier by giving you this as 11, 12, 13. This is the syllogism we're looking at, trying to, to validate. Um, it's, known, it's known as Barbara. I mean, this, this was a Barbara. That was simply Barbara XXX, where there was no modality involved. Uh, but we're now looking at what's called Barbara XQM. X, because this first premise involves no modality, my 11, but premise 12 says that all, B are, all C's are contingently, and he's explicit that it's contingently B. Um, and he's looking at a conclusion, 13, that all C's are, and here he's got possibly A. All right? This is, this is what he's, his, I mean, the Greek is quite clear, this is what he has in mind. Um, so take a look at his proof. Uh, you've got your reductio hypothesis in 14, some C is not possibly A, and then what he wants to do to proceed through the proof, which he can't really, can't get anywhere when he's got this contingently B in here. Um, it doesn't work like it, like it used to. He needs to deal with that somehow. And he says, okay, right, well, it says it's possible, so let's realize it. Suppose, 
when you get to 15, that every seam really is big. Not that it's contingently big, but that it really is. And when you do that, you can proceed. And putting them together, you get to 16. Some B is not possibly A. And when you do that, you end up with a problem because 16 and 11 can't both be true, right? Every B is an A, and 16 says some B is not possibly A. So Aristotle says, right, bingo, um, I've completed my reductio, Barbara XQM um, is valid. Now, uh, the, the important point to, to emphasize is this bit that I've called this proof through realization of a possibility. This is what takes us from 12 to 15. Uh, and the idea simply, as, I, as I've said, is given a premise that something is possible, assume that the possibility is realized, and then reason non-modally. Any non-modal proposition that you obtain this way can then be concluded to be possible. So you can get to your conclusion um, 13. Um, now, logicians will start to get uneasy and a bit tetchy about, about, about what's going on in this. Um, and I've put something down that probably will make people a little bit uncomfortable as well. Prior analytics A15, just below. Um, this is Aristotle again, uh, a, a quote from the text. When something false but not impossible is, in, is assumed, then what results through that assumption will also be false but not impossible. Um, it maybe it can also be false, it might be, but it's not going to be impossible. Uh, but look, Aristotle gets to this point. He, he finishes his proof of Barbara XQM, that 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and says, ta-da, this is a valid syllogism. But he is aware that things aren't all that nice and comfortable right here. Um, he realizes that it doesn't always work, that this, this proof isn't going to always work. And he wants to deal with it. So I've described this for you on the handout um, as Aristotle's caveat. He knows that this isn't always going to work, um, but he also notices, I think, that it, it does work. I think, well, I should say, I think that he notices um, that, that what's going on here is, yes, it, it will work if you restrict your premises appropriately. So we've got to do something a little bit more sophisticated again. Um, so many people will just look at this proof that I've given you and say, oh, you know, you told us he wasn't a terrible logician. Actually, you know, this looks like he's not all that, all that great a logician. This, is, this isn't the best looking proof that we've ever seen. Um, but he sees um, a potential for counterexample in, in just what he's described. And he goes on very, very quickly after this proof and um, tells us how to guard against some, some dangerous mistakes. So look at what he says at the bottom of that page 3 on the handout from Prior Analytics 15. One must take belonging to every. So when you take a premise like every B is A, right? One must take belonging to every without limiting it with respect to time. For example, now or at this time, but rather without qualification. For it's also by means of these sorts of premises that we produce deductions. <coughs> since there will not be a deduction if the premise is taken as holding only at a moment. For perhaps nothing prevents man from belonging to everything in motion at some time, for example, if nothing else should be moving, and it's possible for moving to belong to every horse, but yet it is not possible for man to belong to any horse. And next he says, let the first term be animal, the middle term moving, the last term man. The premises will be in the same relationship then, but the conclusion will be necessary, not possible. For a man is of necessity an animal. It is evident then that the universal should be taken as holding without qualification and not as determined with respect to time. So I read Aristotle here as uh, this is this is a passage some people want to just excise and they say this is this is nasty. It's introducing semantic restrictions on terms. And the father of logic should have in mind a view of logic, which is purely formal and doesn't involve anything to do with the meanings of terms. Um, but it does look as though Aristotle m is probably saying something different here. It does look as though he is introducing a semantic restriction. And I think his idea is, is something uh, maybe best I can explain with, a, um, with the counterexample on page four, at the top of the very top of the page. Uh, I think what Aristotle is doing in this passage is trying to tell us how to avoid problems uh, of the sort that come when we choose premises that just 
happen to hold at any moment. And for an example, I haven't used his terms, I've put my own in. Um, everything in the paddock is a horse. Let's suppose that that's true. Right? Every man could be in the paddock. It's contingently. Every man is contingently you know, in the paddock. He could be. He doesn't have to be, but he could be. And then the conclusion 13, every man could be a horse. We don't want something, we don't, we don't want something um, like this. And, and what Aristotle is, is doing um, is saying, look, one must take belonging to every without res with limiting it with respect to time. So when you look at something like that premise 11 prime, everything in the paddock is a horse. I have fallen afoul of what Aristotle's just described. I've chosen a premise. Right, that everything in the paddock is a horse. It just happens to be. Right? Uh, and he's saying, no, be careful about that. Um, and I, 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 in the paper, in the published paper in the proceedings, I've gone through with a, a, a lengthier explanation of just this. I don't actually want to get too hung up on the semantic points here. Um, my take on this is Aristotle is trying to tell us, look, you can avoid um, this kind of a problem if you choose your premises more carefully, if you choose terms uh, that pick out the essential natures and substances in the world instead of things that um, are accidental like being in the paddock or being white um, and, 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 and that sort of thing which his own examples play with, being moving. Uh, don't, don't choose premises where those kinds of things, like being moving is, in, is a subject, um, that you'll end up with trouble. And I think the way we need to try to read this caveat of Aristotle's is, is telling us we need to choose our terms carefully, restrict the way we're actually reasoning, and we can avoid, avoid problems like this. But um, I guess for the purposes of, of this present paper and the project I'm involved in of trying to say what's going on um, in the definition of a syllogism, what is his notion of, um, if I can use it, logical consequence. Um, when you look at this discussion of a proof, whatever you want to make of it, I mean, some people don't like it, but it's there in the text. Aristotle himself, to be honest, um, you know, I have taken this from the text. Um, you do find several instances of it in there. It does seem to be something that he himself does start to shy away from and find, try to find ways to prefer more direct proofs instead of proofs that do involve this realization of something that's possible. But we have it in there. He is uh, reasoning about uh, taking some possibility as in premise 12 and supposing that it's real, which gets him down to his 15. And um, that suggests that it starts to get very close to what we talk about today when we, when we are talking about um, more of a, a, a possible world semantics notion and, and, and what's involved because his reasoning in this case very, very clearly does move beyond mere matters of fact. Um, he really is telling us that we can syllogize, we can do logic and, and scientific logic, right? Uh, even you know by by moving beyond the and something else is true um, that something supposing that something is the case even when in fact it isn't that it might be but it isn't um, so I think that's pretty unmistakably modal and um, pretty strong evidence that by this stage by the time I think. You, you you just, there isn't textual evidence to decide it. Because people have only really focused, for the most part, on this early part in Aristotle, they're only going to be looking at examples like what I gave you on that first page of the handout. They're never going to get to anything that gives even a hint uh, as to how to decide it. Is it simply trial and error? Does he have something more in mind? But when you end up uh, with premises that he just very casually tells us, you know, just, just yeah, this, this might be false, but just suppose it's true. And when we, get to, when we get to here, we're very explicitly doing that. We are taking possibilities and very explicitly supposing that they are realized, reasoning non-modally, closing off the subproof, and then looking at we've, what we've got. And the fact that he's got to that stage um, does look uh, like evidence that we really can say um, he does have the stronger notion of, of necessity in mind here. Um, now, 
what I've put down here is concluding points. I should probably just talk us through. Um, uh, actually, I can say a little bit more than that. Uh, it's pretty much what I have just said, isn't it? Uh, just, just by way of a different uh, uh, conclusion here, um, I said earlier that ancient scholars do like to make these lists and say, like Sarabji and others, look, there, there may just be an ad hoc approach to necessity in Aristotle. And they'd say to guys like me, Adrian, you know, you're, you're really you know, pushing the limits. It's just, he's got, I think in Sarabji's um, necessity, cause and blame, he gives us a list of about 10 different kinds of necessity. Aristotle never gives us quite so many when he lists them. But there is still this question of whether or not Aristotle did have anything like a univocal um, notion of, of necessity. And um, I, there's an answer to that that's actually quite, quite interesting and just worth pointing out to conclude with. Um, Aristotle did not have anything like what we have today in modern predicate logic with the individual variable. He did have quantifiers. Uh, he also was exploring uh, how quantifiers interact with, with modals. He's exploring how quantifiers and um, uh, his, his structures interact when you add negation. He's exploring all of these kinds of patterns, but he doesn't have anything like the individual variable. And I think that, that something that helps to understand what he is doing and what he isn't doing, um, and helps to answer this question of does he have this, can, can we attribute to Aristotle a univocal notion of necessity? Um, probably not, because he didn't have anything like the individual variable. And without that, um, quite obviously, right, he's not going to have the ability to describe scope that we have today. Um, I've been arguing um, as well in, in a couple of papers and in a recent book that I don't actually see any strong evidence that Aristotle even had a notion of a propositional operator of any sort. So I'm, I'm willing to go a little bit further than, than some others that I just don't see evidence that he had a notion of a propositional operator. So um, we may, you know, when I, I'm sort of grumping about somebody like Sarabji with this list and list and list and saying it's ad hoc. Um, but uh, it does look as though Aristotle does simply lack the expressive tools, the kind of notational tools that we need that make us able to uh, make a clear distinction between um, you know, wide scope and narrow scope and, and, and have, have our uniform notion of necessity that we can treat as a propositional operator. He doesn't, he doesn't get to anything like that. But um, when you ask, does he have um, a really robust notion of logical consequence? Look. Two ways to go answering this. One is that if you just go back to the original Barber, the first one on that handout, um, early on in the prior analytics, um, it might just be that he's, he's a good logic teacher with a good pedagogical style. He's teaching his students logic and he doesn't hit them between the eyes with the full works all at once. It might be that he's holding back, you know, which is what we would all do when you're, you're introducing some material. He is inventing logic and introducing it to his students. Um, and it might be that back at this stage in the, the, not the 11, 12, 13, but the original Barbara without the modals thrown in there, it might well be that there really is that stronger, robust notion of, of necessity at work here when he tells us what a syllogism is. It might be there all along. The textual evidence doesn't tell us that, but by the time we get into these stages, I think the textual evidence is pretty clear that, yeah, he, he does get there in the end towards a strongly modal notion of necessity, that it's not fair to say um, that it was simply trial and error. And um, I think with that, I should probably conclude, but I'd also just like to... Um, make a little bit of a plea for any um, pointers that I can get from anybody here. Uh, part of our project is to try to trace this history um, as best we can, covering as much as we can. And one thing that I do know is that there are many Indian logic traditions. Um, I don't know a whole lot about what those Indian logic traditions are, except that some of them are a good deal more sophisticated than this. Um, and just because I have some of the world experts here, if, there are, if, if people can point me to any um, material that will help with that. It is something I would be very, very grateful uh, to, to have because it will help with the overall project. But, but I suppose that's, that's another story. And please, if you do have things, email me and, and, and give me some direction on that. But thank you. Okay. So thank Adriane. Now we have a little bit of time to have questions. If you have any, please. <laughs> 
네. 아, was just wondering whether what reason we'd have to think that 2 and 3 are not necessarily equivalent for Aristotle. So a case in which we had a substitution instance in which it's possible that the premises are true and the conclusion false, but it's obvious that we don't have any, any substitution instances in which they would be actually true and um, false, and the conclusion false. And I was wondering if allowing for ampliation for possible things doesn't make the inference from 3 to 2 more obvious. So two obviously implies three, but I was wondering why we would think that three wouldn't imply two. Um, okay, the, it's part of the reason that I have structured it this way. There are actually two two sides to the answer to this. Um, part of it is that um, the overall project that we're looking at is one that um, we've, in our approach, we thought to try to tackle the history of necessity as a whole is too, too big. I mean, it's too big for the three of us to do, um, and it's, it's just a huge project. And we needed some sort of a focal point in it. One of the things that we um, did decide to try to take as, as just getting the ball rolling was to look at some of the kinds of work that Etchemendi and others have been doing and look at the different accounts that people have. So um, I'm using that kind of a, a background uh, methodology to just say it, it can, you know, if, if there is such a distinction to make uh, between these kinds of things. I mean, you may not like how I express three. I know some people, some people grump that that's not quite, um, that that's not quite fair. And I've actually even tried to amp it up with the never ever in fact. But um, what I am trying to e explain there is simply the difference that comes out in the classical literature when people do say, don't attribute all of this fancy newfangled mumbo jumbo to Aristotle. He really wasn't, and people say he was not that great a logician. I mean, that's, that's the standard criticism. Uh, I think you'll find more people saying things that he was a brilliant philosopher uh, and, okay, yeah, he invented logic, but oh, thank God, you know, you can read all of the rest of Aristotle's works without ever having to pay attention to the logic. And then they also say, oh, well, he did invent logic, and hey, that was pretty good. But the poor soul went on and started to look at, you know, necessity and possibility, and so on. And um, and they they do say this was just such a mess. They think that his own approach was is best explained by simple trial and error. And it's that that was motivating my dis it's those two features that are motivating the distinction between two and three. Okay. Well, any other question? Yes, there, at the corner. It is, it is not a question, it's just an, a biographical reference of which you might be aware. It's a paper by Stuart Shapiro on, in one of the handbooks of, on philosophy of logic and mathematics where he starts exactly from the definition of logical consequence that you started yeah. yourself from. And then he analyzes of how modern logic okay. has, has explored and developed all the ingredients present. So you might have, have interesting that. things to say about okay. that. Okay, uh, thank you, yeah. yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, here. Uh, others may not be able to hear. Curious, what was in the part one and two of uh, prior analytics? You know, it starts from four to seven. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, basic setting up. Um, in fact, my first definition is is part of prior analytics uh, book one, chapter one. And what you do find in one and two is just a lot of laying out of the technical jargon. Um, explaining to us what premises are and, and what a conclusion is, and um, you know here what he means by a syllogism, um, and it's I don't include that in my breakdown. Like, and some people, somebody might take issue with me on this that I, I don't include um, one and two here, and I don't include them here because they seem to me to be such basic uh, 
for preliminaries and, 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 and ground setting, that it's not clearly anything that, that weighs in on the distinction between whether it's actually modal or not modal. Okay, that's, uh, so that's, that's just a bit of a judgment call on my part. Uh, many people would just want to say, oh, you know, that's part of the good stuff. Um, you know, count that in here and then forget this mess, uh, which seems to be what, what most, most classicists have actually done. Um, and I'm, I'm maybe drawing a little bit of a line in the sand saying, that's the preliminaries. That's telling us all the jargon that he's going to use. Because these, you know, if he's inventing logic, um, the language wasn't there. He is inventing the language and telling us, you know, here is how I am using it uh, for you to understand. So a lot of it is just um, almost like a glossary, and um, not clearly, not clearly involved in any kind of distinction between modal and non-modal. That's that's the only reason. Does he ever use more than two premises? No, he cha what he does, um, no, he doesn't use more than two, and he doesn't even use just one. A syllogism for him does appear to require two premises, uh, and it, it's always in these kinds of simple uh, structures of this sort. What he, what he spends most of his time doing is saying, well, what if, what if I flipped this around to, instead of having all Cs or Bs, what if instead of that I had um, some B is C? Well, you know, this is kind of easy because it's sort of basic transitivity, and they were have been aware of the basic transitivity um, just you know from uh, in all sorts of all sorts of ways. But he's he looks at this and he says, okay, that's that's one of the easy ones. In fact, I mean, anybody can see this. But you know, put your dominoes down, and you know anybody can get this one that you can get you can get from here to here. Um, but he um, does spend time flipping premises around and looking at all of the different kinds of combinations of premises that you can get, but always in this two premise, one line conclusion scheme. He chains them though. He thinks that what scientists do is always reason syllogistically, and he thinks that the project of science is to try to reduce any subject to getting down to these kinds of structures, and if this one wasn't enough, then how do you mean to explain what, you, what exactly do you have in mind? Sorry. In, in, in the modern logic, yeah. we have the predicates of arity greater than one. No, no, we don't. We don't find. Um, you know, there's some somebody tried to write an extension of Aristotle. What you'd get if we started to um, give him a wider range than he does have. But in the text, um, no, I don't think you do find. I'd have to. I'd have to do some serious hunting for any place in there where he might do more. But no, it's it's usually a simple. It's it's actually very simple basic building blocks like this. I am led to believe that it was Boole who was the first one to actually use the binary mm -hmm. relations and so mm -hmm. on. Maybe the logicians can mm -hmm. help me if I'm wrong. Um, so why is it that? It took Boole, and you know, for 20 centuries, to change the nature of the logic from the unary to, to you know, the modern logic. So, yeah. any, any historical reasons you, you might uh, throw the light on? Well, when Aristotle invented this, um, it was picked up and uh, preserved by the, the, the Arab scribes, for one. Um, and when it was rediscovered in the medieval era. It was picked up by um, you know, the church trying to fit the science and reasoning to this so that it had the authority of, the, you know, it, it, of Christendom behind it saying that this is, is what we should be um, you know, trying to understand the nature of God and, and, and so on because the essentialism fits so nicely with so much. So I think that um, that's part of the reason why this lasted as long as it did and why it, it took mankind so long to begin to question and say, what can we go, how can we move beyond it? Uh, but it did take us a very, very long time before we started to try to move beyond it. Um, I think partly because of the, uh, with the excitement of what he had discovered, it was something new. It did, uh, had a certain plausibility that our patterns of reasoning might be working something like this, but looking beyond it, no. Um, there, is a, there is a theory that I have heard some people arguing that, um, there may have been an early rival to what Aristotle was doing, that there may have been an early rival in the form of what we would now call propositional logic, uh, whereas this is very clearly most easily represented as a predicate logic with, the, with essential terms and things. Um, but even that is something that, if it is, it's something we can only conjecture about. There's very little evidence for it. Uh, but no, when this hit the ground, it sort of <laughs> held sway for a couple of millennium. Yeah. Okay. I think we'll have to stop here. Okay. Uh, no, we, we are running out of time.
you can of course meet her uh, outside. And so we thank everybody here and also Adriane for this wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you.